All right, thank you everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series. Each session is designed to deliver a small in-depth dose of cannabis education. My name is Candace Haas and I wanna thank all of our viewers and all of our customers from Bud and Bloom, from the Pottery, and from the Pharmacy Santa Barbara and Berkeley for joining us. In this session, we're gonna dis discuss cannabis product knowledge and I'm excited to have our guest speaker, Nate Winokur, VP of Strategic Development for Bell Costa Labs. Nate is going to give us an insider's perspective on what happens to a cannabis product before it hits the shelves. He's going to cover the procedures, testing requirements, how cannabis samples are collected, analyzed, reported, and he's also going to teach us how to read certificate of, uh, certificates of analysis and product labels. Nate has been involved in a passionate member of the cannabis community for over 19 years. He's witnessed the birth and the growth of, the growth of this professional industry. He's learned the endless possibilities and miracles that come from the cannabis plant. Nate initiated his cannabis career while assisting a growing operation. This provided him with the beginnings of his in-depth knowledge of the cannabis plant. In 2011, Nate began working for a large-scale cannabis laboratory, where he was instrumental in bringing cannabis science and lab testing to Southern California. Nate built this operation from a single employee to a fully functioning lab with over 18 employees. Nate's in-depth, hands-on experience has allowed him to grasp many areas within the science and engineering of cannabis. Finally, in 20, 2016, Nate ventured out on his own to assist extraction labs with their build-out, development, process flow, and optimizations to produce quality products. This led Nate and his team to develop and launch the next level of cannabis analytics, combining perfected analytical methods, re-engineered operating system, customized technology, and through this vision, Bell Costa Labs was born. Based in Long Beach, California, Bell Costa Labs is a brown, groundbreaking lab with fast, fast turnaround times, consistent true science, competitive pricing, and deeply rooted understanding of cannabis. They have quickly risen, riven, risen to an overnight success story and a beacon of what free future cannabis labs should be. Nate's passion and extensive knowledge of cannabis extractions, analytics, cultivation, and infused products have continued to allow him to be very successful teaching on the effects of cannabis in a professional setting. To this day, Nate is engaged with cannabis science and education to the fullest, and his commitment to the cannabis plant and the community have given him the drive to succeed. He is an active member of the LBCA and has frequently talks on cannabis science. I'm happy to have Nate with us and would like to turn it over to him. Thank you, Candace. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for your time today and uh, jumping in and, you know, hearing us cover some information on product knowledge and on uh, cannabis science and what happens in between those things, which is cannabis analytics to make sure a lot of these products are safe and match the dosage claims on the labels. So thank you again, Candace, for uh, the introduction. I'm the VP and uh, run the education strategy for Bell Costa Labs. I'm a member of the founding staff and helped very greatly, very thoroughly with the design of the company and of the laboratory itself and all of that fun stuff. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and let's jump into the presentation. So quick course overview for everybody. I want to just kind of cover what we'll be talking about. Uh, cannabis testing intro, talking about what actually is there in terms of the substance we'll be talking about through the presentation. Product knowledge, which a lot of you guys will know, but we'll be attaching that to cannabis testing, what's necessary. And then actually going through the steps with cannabis product testing, what actually happens. Quality control and compliance, which is how that looks from the other side of the fence, from distribution, cultivation, manufacturing, and then the testing process itself, where we go into quite a bit of depth in terms of what we're actually doing when we test the plants themselves. So an intro to cannabis testing first. I want to be able to share with you guys what ultimately we're doing. Cannabinoid profile, everybody's pretty familiar with that when it comes down to cannabis testing. And when we've all sort of heard or were introduced to the idea that cannabis could be tested. I'm guessing it had to do with what THC potency something was, uh, maybe your favorite strain, maybe a percentage, maybe used as some information to help you make a buying decision. Regardless of what that was, we test over a dozen, 14 different cannabinoids at this time. And it's safe to say that more and more cannabinoids will go will become available for testing and that we'll see many more available as things go forward. Product development or excuse me, uh, method development, scientific method development is very important 
for helping to determine accurate measurements for all of these cannabinoids. And that same principle applies for other types of tests that we run. Terpene profiles will be interesting. This is something that we can do, and if it's being claimed on packaging, something very much that needs to be tested for by compliance. But other than that, terpene profiles and terpene profile testing is really just an option. It's not actually part of the compliance profile. Terpenes, you guys are, are familiar with, which I'm right on the heels of Frenchie, right? I'm sure terps came up once or twice in a conversation like that. Um, are one of the chemical groups of volatile chemicals that will show up within cannabis outside of the cannabinoids. Now, terpenes are interesting. Uh, it's worth mentioning, though, that even though a terpene profile is all of that volatile profile that can be run, there are numerous other chemicals out there, flavonoids, um, uh, esters, uh, and so on and so forth. So we can, of, of course, look forward in terms of cannabis testing to even greater levels of detail in the future. Next one, which come up, came up a minute ago, is pesticides and PGRs. That's plant growth regulators for PGRs. Those essentially are plant hormones. In uh, the cases of what we're looking for, we're looking for 67 different chemicals, which are known to be harmful, mainly harmful to humans and mammals, although some of them are harmful to the environment and to fish and wildlife. And a few of them are considered to be bad actors for those reasons. Heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals are uh, one of the newer types of tests that exist in the cannabis industry. And so we're really just learning a lot about heavy metals and where they come from. A lot of them from the grow mediums or from the ground, some from the water. Uh, very frequently, we'll see heavy metals come from uh, consumption methods as well. Uh, certain poor cartridges have been shown to just I mean, really puke out just terrible amounts of lead. So that's something to keep in mind. Next is, oh, there we go, two for one. We got foreign materials and we have microbial. Uh, foreign materials, we're looking for actual foreign materials, dirt, uh, plants, um, you know, parts of uh, tools or fiber used in the growing process. We're looking for things under a microscope that could be harmful if combusted upon and certainly things that you're not meant to consume. Microbial panel is an interesting one. There are only six different types of pathogens we're looking for at this time. Two different types of bacteria and four different types of uh, fungus. That would be four different species of aspergillus, uh, then for bacteria, E. coli and salmonella. Residual solvents are something very specific to products that are made from extracted components. We're looking for the solvents that were part of an extraction process. Mycotoxins are related to a microbial panel. If you're familiar with aspergillus, aspergillus, that type of mold, isn't just harmful, it's capable of producing these harmful toxins called mycotoxins. I think myco means mold, like mycology is the study of mold, mycotoxins are just that. Uh, water activity. So this is a measurement to see how many, how much free water uh, or free water molecules are uh, there on the surface of the plant. These water molecules are unbound. They uh, could potentially be fuel of a sort or uh, allow for growth of microbial life. A high water activity um, would mean that uh, you could have something that molds up pretty readily. Bear in mind, we don't look for every type of mold. We only look for harmful mold and specifically four different species of aspergillus. Aspergillus is one of hundreds, thousands of molds out there. And there are 180 species of aspergillus. We're only looking for four of them, which means that you could have mold grow on your plant or rather on your, the cannabis you might consume. You certainly don't want that. And to make sure that you don't have a mold friendly environment, water activity is tested upon. Moisture analysis sim is similar, but it's used also to help us calculate potency. If we have something to uh, suggest that something might be drying out, and as it dries, the potency could be said to be higher because the water might be offsetting that, we actually do a calculation on our side where we, when we test potency, also test moisture, and doing that, we're able to back out the offset from the moisture itself. 
So that's that for uh, the basic introduction to cannabis testing. Now those are the different types of tests we run. So let's look at the type of products that are out there in the market and what can actually be tested upon and what types of tests are necessary for each product. Bear in mind that something like residual solvents or you test for uh, leftover solvents from the extraction process. Odds are when we look at flour, the state is not going to have us look for residual solvents in that flour. So keep that in mind. So what is flour and raw biomass? It's full of raw cannabinoids. That's kind of important. That's uh, all of the THCA or CBDA or that suffix A that you see keep popping up. That suggests that it's an, an acidic or a raw cannabinoid. It is uh, somewhat different from its active known form. So that's to say that THCA is very different from THC. When you uh, decarboxylate THC, that's to say often when you burn it or if you're infusing it into a product, when you heat it through that infusion, that's when you're looking at decarboxylation taking place. If you've ever heard that word decarboxylation, we're looking at that process where those raw cannabinoids are activated. Again, this can happen from lighting something on fire. So you can pack a bowl full of THCA and what you're breathing in will be the post-combusted THC. Delta 9 THC, I should say. Its cannabis in its most basic form can be extracted from, smoked, or infused into other products. Uh, for a lot of us, it was an introduction point to cannabis. First time I ever smoked, it was certainly with flour many, 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 many moons ago. And with uh, how uh, often it is, uh, with the flavor profiles are there, with the um, fortunate uh, accessibility we have to it in California. I love flour. It's not the only thing I love, but I don't just look at it as something that to be consumed really from working in the industry and working at a lab. And for a lot of these types of products that we talk about, this is part of our supply chain. So when we talk about a supply chain with cannabis, I don't just look at flour as something to be consumed. This is the inception point for everything that we work with and anything that I ultimately have the opportunity to test in its rendered forms started as this, it's very significant. Juicing raw cannabis is starting to become popular, although that's not really available on the dispensary level. It's for people who are actually growing it themselves. Now that much said, people have been able to kick all sorts of crazy things like Crohn's disease and actually keep that at bay through juicing. Pretty cool. And to a previous point, just as much cannabis is, is grown for extraction as for smoking, such as other agricultural products, such as corn or olives, have similar systems to large scale, large scale extraction versus products in their native form that could be found as something that actually looks like an olive and looks like corn or you know, as opposed to corn oil or olive oil or cannabis oil. So to keep talking about this, we've got pre-rolls are very popular in an array of a, a variety of different qualities. Um, there are uh, versions of uh, enhanced products out there that have oil, keef, hash, which are really difficult with regards to uh, the ability to test these things alongside uh, how difficult you would consider to be, uh, other products coming to market. Now, to be specific about that, if somebody's ever testing their flour, they're just testing their flour for this whole panel, these eight different types of tests that you see popping up. Now, if somebody's going to be testing an enhanced product, we'll see that in a couple of slides, and you have to test even more because they assume it's the every world, it's a concentrate and it's a flower and it's everything in between. They throw, the state has you throw everything at it basically, it's pretty crazy. These are the required tests for flower. You heard what we were doing before with these guys. Cannabinoid, microbial, mycotoxins, pesticides, heavy metals, water activity, moisture, and foreign materials. So that's what we're looking for when we have flower that's being tested for compliance and it needs to pass all eight of those panels. You might be thinking, wait, does that mean that a single sample that we pull out in the field comes back to our lab and we have to take this one thing and this one piece of inventory that we need to now click carefully keep track of, split it into eight different versions of itself and then test it through a complete panel and then bring all of the information back to one point and not screw anything up. Yes, that's a lab's job. That's what we have to do with every single sample. We see about 150 compliance samples a day. Cannabis flour is often rendered into pre-rolled joints. It can be blended or single strain in packs or singles. 
the rules change a little bit when it comes to compliance in these cases. See, with flour, the maximum batch size is 50 pounds. When it comes to something like pre-rolls, the maximum batch size is 150,000 units. So if a unit's a pack of 20 joints, not very likely, but if that's a unit, then is in a single batch, is that 2 million pre-rolls? Yep. So you can see massive differences between what would be considered at this point a rendered product, which can have, again, up to 150,000 units, 150,000 singles, 150,000 packs, 150,000, as long as it's, as it's the same thing, just packaged differently, 150,000 mix of packs and singles, and whatever else you've seen. Now, rarely do I ever see anything that high. Very rarely at this point in the industry are people even hitting batches of 10 to 15,000 but it actually is written in law that we could get 10 times bigger than that. So it's out there. As mentioned, maybe enhanced with Keith hash, hash oil. Again, the opportunities for failing in those types of products are so much higher. It's not just the failure that you might be looking at potentially from just flour, but you might be looking at accumulated chemical content of uh, different or of the same contaminant from both flour and concentrate and part of the pre-roll itself. And all things told, you may see a fail come from these accumulated different sources. Uh, infused and uh, products such as infused pre-rolls are very difficult to make. Um, hats off to those manufacturers who are able to uh, crank those out consistently. Not easy products to do. And uh, yeah, uh, more opportunities for contamination than other products. Uh, you guys know that already. Sorry about that. Avoid dry pre-roll products. Um, freshness as a cannabis consumer, I would say, as long as we're mentioning these kind of things is out there. Now, if you ever have the opportunity for uh, being able to view for licensed products, the uh, um, uh, package by date, you'll often be able to see a package date, which will give you a little bit of a reflection for the freshness itself of a product such as pre-rolls. This can be a pretty helpful tool. Uh, you, using this, and especially if you manufacture this terpene test, will help you avoid drier, you know, poor quality products. Um, flavored doesn't always equal better. Of course, that's an opinion right there as a smoker. But I would say that flavored, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of cannabis flavor, of good cannabis flavor. And if that's there, no real reason to flavor over it. As mentioned, they throw... <clears throat> They throw the whole kitchen at the pre-rolls. Pre-rolls see everything, including residual solvents, inclu including moisture and water activity. They assume it could grow mold like a flower. They assume it could have residual solvents. Even if a pre-roll does not have an infused product added to it, the state still assumes that you might and still has us do a residual solvent test. So for anybody who's thinking about adding some keep to their pre-rolls, why not? We're going to test it like it's in there anyway, right? We've got smokable concentrates, solvent-free extractions such as keef, rosin, hash is considered solvent-free. Water is a solvent though, so I'm sort of solvent-free. We can, you know, I'm, I'm just really, you know, split and spitting into semantics though. That's not a big deal. CO2, uh, we don't see too much smokable CO2, but it is out there as some vapable form and in, uh, as uh, what's been infused into some products. Hydrocarbon, often butane, although there's more, of course, than just butane and propane. Hydrocarbon extractions very frequently refer to butane, propane, often a blend between the two. And there are plenty of alternative organic solvents as well. Concentrates, these things are largely available in smokable, dabbable products or preloaded into vape pens. Not too much of a surprise there. Products may be available as a live product, meaning that they were extracted in their freshly harvested form. A lot of people have heard terms, you know, live terms, live raws and live resin. It means that something was extracted in a form when it was freshly harvested, often harvested, frozen, and then from a frozen form is how it's being extracted. With this, you're allowing uh, through very specific extraction uh, methods 
uh, what's called live resin, which uses often hydrocarbon extraction, or I shouldn't say often, it is a hydrocarbon extraction, and live rosin, which uses a, a water bath hash extraction uh, that goes to a rosin press. In both cases, we have uh, extraction methods that are uh, able to work with waterlogged frozen cannabis. And so if you've ever wondered why there are of, of all the different extraction techniques, live rosin and live resin seem to be the only two live ones. Again, it's necessary to have an extraction that ignores the fact that this uh, product is full of water. Most extractions that take place take place with dried cured products. If any of you have been smoking for the majority of your life, like I, the vast majority of products you've had uh, in the extracted world have been extracted from dried cure products. And those live products are something relatively new on the scene. Of course, drop out questions if you guys have, have anything going on with that, but let me move on here. High terpene hydrocarbon extracted sauce products have recently emerged available in smokable and vapable form. So much of a terpene content that we're not really seeing any solubility, any uh, homogeneous solubility between uh, the cannabinoids and the uh, terpene cannabinoid portion. You will see a fairly high cannabinoid portion in those sauces, but so much sauce present in this and that sauce acts as essentially a solvent and dissolves a lot of compounds around it. Really interesting how all that works. Recombinant product types exist as well, utilizing both alternatively derived botanical terpenes as well as cannabis derived volatile profiles. So uh, recombinant types do exist, are starting to disappear more and more. Um, I'm starting to see the, you know, cannabis derived, you know, vape pen carts and like live resin and live rosin and sauce carts and anything they're mentioning out there. It seems like the secret is out that yeah, for most people, especially in that connoisseur crowd, they're moving more and more away from an alternatively flavored product and more and more into something that's actually flavored like cannabis. Dabs uh, as a cannabis consumer is something else that's close to my heart and a uh, very, very easy and uh, convenient way to uh, get your smoke on, as they say. Hash oil may be vaporized smoke through special devices designed through this purpose. And valuable chemicals are concentrated, shelf life is increased, and inert plant, uh, plant products are removed. Obviously, I'm a little biased. Oops, excuse me, let me boom back. I'm a little biased when it comes to these, but generally speaking, we're looking at a different way of enjoying cannabis that in recent years has just gotten better and better. Not that I prefer one to another. It's, you know, whiskey versus beer in my world. But I think dabs have a very, very interesting dynamic and flower does as well. Different qualities impacted by the state of the starting material, mainly, and different processing methods and conditions. There's very little idea of where you would take something that is an absolute treachery of plant matter that is has no flavor value and no real value to it outside of just a generic extraction. And it's not really possible to turn that into something magical. Quality of the, of the extraction itself follows the quality of the starting plant matter. Solvent made and solvent less products are all marketed and total terpene profile can be through the roof up to 15%, although something that high is rare, uh, the best of the products can hit about 10 to 12%. Required tests for concentrates and vapes. Now we see a few less here. Uh, it's because there are fewer ways for them to spoil, although residual solvent test is obviously making an appearance. We have cannabinoids, pesticides, and PGRs, heavy metals, Foreign materials, again, we need to make sure that there's nothing in there and stuff has been found, bugs and what have you, in concentrates. We have found bugs and cartridges before. That's odd, but it's there. Uh, and reasons for these tests. Microbial panel, residual solvents, and mycotoxins again. Now, there are increased opportunities for fail in concentrates because, spoiler, it's concentrated, right? What we're looking at here is when you concentrate terpenes and the other volatiles, you make them greater, you concentrate them in your product. And when you talk about doing this for cannabinoids, we're looking at concentrating something five to 10 times percentage wise over its original form when you remove all of these other inert components. But wait, you also have the opportunity to concentrate all of the contaminants and all of the bad crap that you don't want in there. And this becomes an issue. You can actually go from uh, plant matter that tests clean and post-extracted tests dirty. 
It's because there are certain contaminants out there that you can fail for in such low amounts that it can go from virtually invisible to barely showing and per California law for some of the worst contaminants out there, which happen to be some of the most uh, common contaminants out there in the pesticide world as well, can be instant fails. So those are crazy. And those would be in the world of chlorinated pesticides. Feel free to ask more about that when we get to the end here. So we have non-inhalable uh, products. Non-inhalable is the state's uh, term for infused. They're non-inhalable edibles and non-inhalable topicals, of course. Cannabis can be infused into food and tincture products. Unlike smoking, edibles may have a slow onset. There are water, uh, let's see, uh, a uh, version of cannabis products out there which have been made um, on a molecular level, uh, water soluble, and they may be referred to as rapid onset products. The vast majority of products out there that I just hear about in the buzz of rapid onset products are not well made. And so there are a lot more claims of rapid onset out there than actually do exist. So if you guys are wondering more about that, just at the on base level, be very skeptical. Um, rapid onset is something very difficult to achieve and many people uh, feel like they're, they get partway there and make that claim all the way. And that really isn't a very good way to explain uh, biology and how our bodies would process cannabis. Maximum serving is 10 milligrams uh, and 100 milligrams per product, 10 servings per product. Uh, there are medical cannabis and tincture exceptions to that, but that's California recreational for you. CBD rich products play a strong role in infused. Uh, micro dosing versus macro dosing are all things to consider. Macro dosing for a lot of people who are uh, amongst the uh, uh, ones who seek the greatest level of cannabis therapy, uh, cancer patients, uh, epilepsy patients, and so forth. Microdosing could be said to be for everybody. There are very interesting specific uh, benefits that come from microdosing for certain specific patients and certain specific uh, instances. For instance, there's been uh, some evidence showing that microdosing leads to some elements of liver repair. That's pretty amazing. And these, some of these elements are said to go away as soon as you take large doses. This means that cannabis can have a use for those that even have zero interest in uh, having a level of, uh, in the psychoactive aspect of cannabis. Often full of sugar, eating extracts is a high dose alternative. And what am I talking about there? So sometimes my stomach gets upset. And sometimes to conquer an upset stomach, I want a big dose of THCA. This might mean that I'll roll some of that hash together and I'll eat it. That's right, I'll eat hash. Hash is full of THCA. THCA has a high binding affinity to the cannabinoid receptors that are found within the stomach. And to that point, you're sending an anti-inflammatory chemical has high binding affinity to these receptors to a part of the body that in the instance of my upset stomach will benefit greatly from these things instead of eating an edible that's full of sugar and maybe took a little while to process through my body, I didn't need a second dessert, let's say, maybe eating hash is actually going to be a pretty awesome alternative to feeling better. And it often is, and that's going to be, that's a tool in my, uh, uh, in my proverbial tool chest of home remedies. As promised, non-inhalable topicals. <clears throat> Cannabis topical applications, very widespread, includes healing, pain killing, and anti-inflammation. Uh, high dosage is often necessary for significant results. I'm glad that most topicals out that are out there come in little tiny containers. That makes me think that if a little tiny container contains say 100 milligrams, one dose that I might actually need to rub into that in pain body part may actually see a significant dose. Back in the day of Prop 215 in California, at least when we saw um, topicals first come out, I mean, you would get a bucket of lotion and it would cost $20. And I really didn't trust that. I didn't feel like you could, you know, for what ultimately needs to be marked up to $20 on the retail side. I didn't feel like uh, they uh, allowed somebody to put a high enough dose uh, inside of something that I would use. I feel like cannabis at that point is just a feel good option. You want high dosage to be able to actually combat some of these issues that you can see with regards to topical treatment. 
uh, many tinctures, especially alcohol-based ones, which surprises a lot of people because you don't see alcohol-based tinctures out there, but by California law, alcohol-based tinctures under two ounces are legal. Very interesting, but uh, may be used externally as well as internally. So just throwing that out there in case anybody's thinking about being the next alcohol tincture uh, manufacturer out there. That could be something that we need. I would buy one, I'm just saying. Safe and common entry point for a large number of consumers. That's an opinion, but I have noted there are a large number of people out there who would not smoke cannabis, who are happy to take the benefits of it from a topical perspective. Required test for infused products. Very, very similar to what we end up seeing for the, um, uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry, I am trying to say uh, concentrated products. Microbials, we'll see even fewer microbial products uh, tested in there because there are even fewer types of pathogens that are named, known to grow or be harmful in these infused areas. Just for fun, some specialized areas. If you guys ever saw those hash wrapped blunts that are out there, that blunt that's that's there. I took a picture of this a few years ago prior to the current market. It's actually not tobacco or hemp, that's all hash. So that's a product that didn't make that crossover. Yeah, it was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And you could have smoked it by itself and it would have been significant. So a lot of specialized variations. Do bear in mind that these specialized variations, the state very frequently will throw just the entire kitchen at you. They'll make you do everything in terms of testing. So cannabinoids and terpenes are two best available measurements of cannabis quality. We are now in, I sort of just jumped into this area. We're talking about cannabis testing now, and I'd like to introduce you guys as uh, smoothly as possible to the general idea of cannabis testing and what's happening. Cannabinoids and terpenes are the two best available measurements of cannabis quality for naturally grown or minimally processed products. Both can be measured by an analytical laboratory such as Bell Costa Labs. And a high pressure liquid chromatograph is used for cannabinoids while a gas chromatograph is used for terpene analysis. High terpene content typically has the greatest bearing in cannabis flower and in some of the concentrates being considered of a high quality. We've seen uh, in the testing world, many, many different uh, instances and content contests and all that fun stuff suggesting that the terpenes themselves have a much greater bearing in terms of somebody's uh, general pleasure, experience, everything that goes into consuming that product. Avoiding the dangerous materials. So we talked about the good stuff, that's cannabinoids and terpenes. Although you could say cannabinoid test is kind of a safety test as well. If we're talking about infused products, we need to make sure it's not overdosed and maybe from another side of things, although it's not having to deal with safety specifically, we can make sure that you're not taking anything underdosed either and having a, an underwhelming experience would ultimately lead to that ailment not being fixed for a person or them not feeling any better and you know potentially wasting their money, which is just a kick in the seat of the pants. So alongside uh, cannabinoids themselves being considered in certain instances a safety test of sorts as well, we have pesticides, obviously, PGRs, those are those plant growth regulators I mentioned earlier, heavy metals, mycotoxins, pathogens, dihydrogen monoxide. If anybody's an internet nerd and they recognize dihydrogen monoxide, that's just water. So. Uh, Dihydrogen monoxide, uh, city of Aliso Viejo once upon a time, apparently almost banned water because of an old internet hoax. So if you're interested, write down that name right there and do a little bit of a search and see what's going on. And I'm not just bagging on people who accidentally give into internet hoaxes here. Dihydrogen monoxide or water is tested for in two different forms. That's water activity as well as the moisture analysis. In other words, yes, you can actually fail a safety test for having water. California compliance testing went into effect on January 1st, 2018. Cities and states began, or cities and the state began enforcing it soon thereafter by, the, uh, by roughly July 1st. All levels of cannabis screening are in effect. More will likely be added in the coming years. We're talking about a new, very virginal industry that's still just figuring things out. Things are probably going to be found out in terms of future versions of contamination, and those will be added to panels, and those will be, unfortunately, even more ways across the hundreds of different types of safety tests we're running. Uh, there are more ways that you can fail. 
cannabis regulation includes the need for all cannabis products to be tested prior to retail. Uh, we at Belcoaster Labs are very fortunate that we test virtually every top shelf product in the state. So we are not the biggest testing lab, but odds are that if you're a top shelf consumer, um, most, if not all of the brands that you consume come through us, uh, including uh, Glasshouse, which is a uh, sister with a uh, sister with, um, uh, why can't I think of the name of your dispensary? I'm sorry, Candace, uh, but the sister to the uh, to pottery and to the, um, somebody help me out here. Thank you. Worst moments, huh? Failed batches are allowed to be remediated up to two times. California BCC, Bureau of Cannabis Control, focuses heavily on preventing diversion to the black market. So this is pretty important. What we've got right here are that you can actually have something that fails. So you can fail for water and following a fail for water, you can actually be allowed to remediate it. That means you're allowed to dry it out and then retest it. California does want you to test a complete additional panel, but it is interesting to see people being given these additional turns. The BCC, Bureau of Cannabis Control, has heavy control over virtually everything we do. What types of tests are run on each product, how much weight and or how many units, depending on the batch size, is to be collected, reporting how those past uh, fail results are reported, uh, how much of each contaminant is allowable. That's if you hear me make the reference to action limit, limits. That's me referring to quite literally that, how much of a certain contaminant you are allowed to have before it leads to a fail. Enforcing that any chemical difference from one product to another necessitates the need for creating a new slash different tested product batch. What does that mean? It means that if you have two different flavors of vaporizer, even though they're extremely similar, they were made from the same oil and it's just a little bit of flavor that's the difference, shouldn't they be able to be tested the same? No, unfortunately, the state still has you call them two different batches. The idea behind them had, uh, oh, excuse me, the idea behind them um, running that or pushing this type of an idea is going to be related to the idea that we have a, um, uh, opportunities for different types of pesticides, different types of heavy metals, uh, different types of solvents for different types of flavors. And so any even subtle change, the state says that a new type of, unfortunately, a kind of expensive full panel test is necessary. Companies request compliance through the distributor or testing lab. Multiple levels of quality assurance and quality control process should be considered, but it's not a requirement. Still though, about two thirds of the business that we have are people testing their stuff before compliance, not waiting till compliance to find out if they'll fail. And results are always sent to the state first, then to the distributor. It's about two seconds difference in time, but the requirement is that the state gets the information first. And so that's very specific because you cannot report anything to anyone without telling the state first. So what is quality control and compliance? We mentioned QC, QA, QC a moment ago. So products have different QA, QC needs. With QA, QC, we're talking about these steps that a lot of these companies need to get go through sometimes referred to as R&D in order to produce the type of product they mean to produce. That means they need the right kind of materials. Often it means they need to do micro extractions. Remember me mentioning earlier that you could take passing plant matter and actually get failing concentrate out of that. There is a, a thing out there called micro extractions where a lot of these companies will take a very small sample of a product and prior to running it through their lab and risking contaminating everything, we'll just do a very tiny extraction just for the sake of seeing if the post extracted material shows any types of contaminants that the uh, base material, the raw material didn't. There are difficulties with contamination, cleanup, and remediation. You might have to shut down your company for a couple of weeks if it means cleaning off every surface and the inside of every machine. Think about that. Not worth it. Very often, make sure that you're being doing levels of testing prior to this. You can imagine that if you're failing on a compliance level, we have to very often reverse engineer the entire process in order to be able to see what could have actually happened. Where did this contamination come from? Did it even come from that run? Or was it cross contamination from the solvent that you used from a different run? So on and so forth. And we were talking with Frenchie last, last time around. That was a water extraction. 
and water you need to dump between instances. Not just would you be looking at contamination of, say, terpenes, you could be looking at contamination of pesticides or accumulation of these things as well. You should clean out your whole bath. Maintaining a high cannabinoid and terpene pro, uh, content is paramount. And the only way to really be able to do that well is with R&D, as well as safety, of course. So we're looking at the need to not only be able to um, accurately get the highest efficiency, you know, extraction wise or whatever have you through R&D. If you're a product manufacturer, like an infused manufacturer, you need to make sure that your whole vat of stuff you're mixing, all your proverbial cookie or brownie dough, as I kind of have a brownie picture there, uh, but brownie dough, all of that stuff that's mixing up is completely homogenous from one end to another. You're not doing any good if your target is 100 milligrams, but your brownies are hit at 150 and 50 milligrams, right? You've got the right amount, 200 milligrams in this example of a batch, but you do not have what you actually need in order to produce a quality product. And so homogenization and production are huge to be able to accomplish these things. This all comes down to, as well as proper dosage, being able to measure everything, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, not just a concern with regards to manufacturing things correctly and being able to develop your fan base through making a consistent product, but you need to have been doing these levels of testing to make sure that you don't create these safety concerns either. If somebody has a heinously overdosed product, that's not a good look. Cultivated flower also has very ex extensive quality control needs. A lot of testing early in the process, need to test the grow mediums, need to test the water, need to test the clones, need to test virtually everything that goes into there. It says sneaky pathogens and contaminants. There's all sorts of nasty stuff that can sneak into your, into your garden that could be avoided if you have the opportunity to test it first. There are all sorts of systemic pesticides that could drain from your clone and then end up in your water system and then to be able to, from your water system, even in the drain off, get picked up by future runs of water and that will actually contaminate the plants. Systemic past pesticides are nasty shit and I don't wish that on my worst enemy. I don't have any enemies, but if I did, I wouldn't wish it on them. Not that I know of. Pre-compliance is its own special thing, and we want to verify that your products are safe for some of these same reasons. Confirms expectations of product with regards to sales and brand needs. Make sure that it's as strong as it needs to be prior to compliance. Ensures that no dangerous materials eluded quality assurance and quality control process prior to bringing something to compliance. Having anything that's going to be moldy or wet or anything else is not a good look. We want to help somebody avoid that and even avoid if that's going to be something that could have caused them to fail on the compliance end. We don't want them spending a bunch of money for compliance testing and holding their collective breath just to find out they'll fail. I want testing beforehand because that tells me if something's going to pass and then testing on the compliance end becomes a formality, not a collective breath holding. So what goes wrong with cannabis as I'm in the middle of all that? Pesticide concentration, an inadvertent result of producing concentrated products. You guys kind of know that now because you're experts now. Thank you for sitting through this class. You guys are amazing. Early storage and prepackaging can lead to microbial contamination issues. Poor homogenization and infused product manufacturing. Overspray from neighboring crops is a common source of pesticide issues. Does that sound crazy? How about this one? I've seen a $3 million uh, greenhouse. $2 billion of that was actually building the greenhouse. The third million dollars was actually building a positive pressure system that just blew air out of the greenhouse at all times, especially when the doors were open because it was in an agricultural area and needed to make sure that because food crops are constantly spraying and the action limits, remember those words on foods, are so much higher than cannabis, this much action limit of food means that just a tiny fraction of what's allowable in food, if that gets in your cannabis, your cannabis fails. And so positive pressure, you know, greenhouse in a case like that is worth an extra 50% of the overall cost of startup. Insane, but that's a reality. Vape cartridges can leach heavy metals into cannabis oil. Oof. You also have that whole vitamin E thing. That fortunately doesn't come up very often. People learned their lesson about a year ago on that one. So... 
yeah, lots happened in the world since last September when that whole vape gate thing came out. You don't hear about that too much anymore, but that was a thing. Um, and uh, although vitamin E, people kind of learn their lesson with that and generally spoken, staying away from cut uh, oil and cartridges, everybody can kind of agree that that's good for everyone. Um, there are other issues that can happen, uh, especially with crappy cartridges, especially with old cartridges. If you found that old cartridge that rolled, uh, you know, underneath the seat in your car and it's been through many summers and hot nights, uh, there's a good chance that that had a chance to break down. And uh, when it broke down, it leached a lot of heavy metals into that. Uh, that lead contamination is significant. Stay away. Just toss it. So what's the testing process? Testing lab sends its sampler team to the distributor. Samplers must be directly employed by the lab. We can't just grab anybody to send there. Sampling is recorded and directly observed, state requirement, by the distributor. Beyond that, it is a hands-off process. The lab is only allowed to touch. The distributor watches us like a hawk by state regulation. They need to be recording us. They need to be watching us in, in the same room. Sampler team utilizes random number generation to assist in the collection to assure that the collection is taken from different parts of the batch, assuring a statistically significant representation of the batch. Several pieces of paperwork are signed by both parties, distributor and testing lab, and retained as information for the BCC if and when requested. We also have manifesting, which keeps track of where and how everything moves around. Intake process is then what takes place. So we're looking at those samples actually arriving here, or here, I'm sorry, to the lab when they arrive. And those samples are taken to Bell Coast and immediately enter into the first of our many internal labs called the intake lab. The forms that we work with are scanned, the info from those forms is input, photos are taken, labels are printed, so that we have the opportunity to keep track of everything internal to the lab. Once the intake process is complete, samples are forwarded to the sample prep lab. In sample preparation, samples are thoroughly homogenized, broken down specifically according to the method for that specific test. Each test has its own preparation and read through different instrumentation subsequent to being uh, prepared in its own special way. Precisely calibrated analytic balances, that's a fancy word for scales, solvent pumps and micro pipettes are used. Everything's calibrated as mentioned by a different kind of ISO accredited lab. The most intensive labor aspect, highest possibility of error is in that sample preparation via the human interaction portions. There are some people who use automated areas, but the, even the automated areas uh, come with their own difficulties for the sake of consistency. Once a sample has been properly prepared, it is forwarded to the instrument lab. So we had everything come in, it got picked up by the samplers, went to intake, we kept track of everything as we digitized all the information, and then it went to prep. All the samples actually got worked to be able to work through the rail their individual instruments, and now we have the instrument analysis. Different instruments perform different tests. We mentioned a few of these before, but feel free to read through the list. HPLC as potency and label accuracy, high pressure liquid chromatograph, a gas chromatograph with flame ionization detection, just terpenes. Uh, we have a gas chromatograph with flame ionization detect or uh, with a mass spectrometer that does uh, our residual solvents now. A qPCR is microbial. That's what you hear very frequently when uh, mentioned with the rapid COVID testing that exists. They're using that same kind of an instrument we've been using for many years. So it's a qPCR. So what we use to genetically match things. So we're not just matching things based on any kind of a guess or based on what a more uh, basic panel would show. We're actually matching DNA with that. Heavy metals are tested by uh, IC. PMS, an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. That mofo gets hotter than the center of the sun in order to convert uh, metals into plasma so that we are able to ultimately tell what those metals are through their transition and rate of transition. Pesticides, PGRs, mycotoxins are tested through LCMS. Um, and we're looking at chlorinated pesticides, yet a different kind of pesticide tested through another kind of MS, that's a mass spectrometer, a GCMS. 
We're looking to be, oh, that's a little outdated, soon to be residual solvent. My GCMS is uh, how I test residual solvents. And a biological safety cabinet is used for microbial plating. Uh, it's actually something that we now have as part of our method for microbial, uh, for microbial testing. Data is produced by these instruments and is analyzed. Redundancies and processes are employed to determine the data accuracy following analysis. Samples may be reprepped and retested prior to data analysts and quality control manager releasing those results. We have to be we have to be careful. We have to be certain. And data analysts specialize in different types of instrument instrumentation. So although we employ multiple different data analysts, they're all working on different ways and uh, specialists in different types of instruments. Following lab quality assurance steps, information is uploaded first to the BCC for compliance testing, then to the entity who submitted the samples, the samples which is the distributor. For non-compliance testing, info is available only to the sample submitter. So if it's just R&D testing, that just belongs to whoever submitted it. That doesn't get sent to the state. The sampler submitted has access to the results uh, through a portal and other utilities, a COA, QR codes, product labels, and so forth. Through a portal where all the current and historical testing info is kept. In cases of batch failure and all that fun stuff, the product may be further remediated and further testing it to be able to be used to audit the, uh, the facility or process from which that fail may have come through. Samples get destroyed as well. BCC can visit unannounced at any time and request the remaining amount of sample be turned over to them prior to destruction. And samples may only be destroyed through a certified destruction, destruction service, somebody who picks it up and manifests it properly, not through a series of small fires. Uh, batch sampling samples are maintained in a manner which uh, prevents degradation freezing for 45 business days, which is just over two months after the sample was originally collected before the remaining product is destroyed. So destruction is a very specific not to be messed with process. We covered all of these guys and although this was meant to be kind of a recover just to kind of ram it in there. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time and so I'm going to go right to reading a certificate of analysis. Did the batch pass or fail? That's the first thing I want to know when reading a certificate of analysis. Am I looking at something that passed or am I looking at something that failed? Now, really, when we get down to a certificate of analysis, I jumped into this a little too quickly. What is a COA or certificate of analysis? This is the main deliverable that comes from a testing lab. Whenever you submit your, your uh, samples to a testing lab, this is what you're waiting for, ideally with the word pass on it, and we'll cover that in a moment. When we talk about this being submitted to a testing or the samples being submitted, all of these testing steps that I just covered in this presentation are going to be taking place. And then I remember how I mentioned that data is basically what comes out the back end of this process. Well, that data that comes out the back end of this process is ultimately what is recorded on the COA. It's a certification, it's a, certifi it's a certificate of analysis. It shows that we did our job and it shows that this is the analysis and these are the numbers that you can determine from what ultimately was picked up and tested upon. So can we tell if the batch passed or failed? Hell yeah. If it failed, what happened? It will tell you specifically what contaminant uh, caused the fail and uh, what type of um, uh, action level difference we saw in terms of what's legal versus what was found. For compliance testing, is all the cultivator, manufacturer, distributor info present? All of that's going to be there. It's a little bit redacted on my form right there. But if you're looking at this from, say, a dispensary level or purchasing or selling product, all of it's right there in front of you. Test types change depending on the matrix. What types of tests were run? You guys learned about that at the beginning of this. Now, all of those different types of tests that we mentioned in their various formats and the various different mixes and matches of tests will be here on the certificate of analysis. Infused products are read in milligrams per gram. How does that information translate? Well, this actually tells us milligrams per gram. It tells us the grams of the total product and per serving, which means you multiply those numbers together and you get the total number of milligrams per serving or per product. Pretty awesome. How does this information get to the BCC? We're responsible for sending it. We have to send it digitally to them via multiple uh, different methods, historically, uh, largely via metric. And look how that happens. So we have reading a certificate of analysis. Now, although everything looks a little tiny, let me see if I can zoom in for you guys ever so. This is a pretty clumsy process, but look at all those passes and green marks. That's kind of a happy thing that I'm seeing. 
So when that when we see all of that, we're looking at something that ultimately passed and passed extremely well. So we're looking at all of these different things done. We're looking at right at the top of this. Let me just see if I can back it in a little bit better. We're looking at the cannabinoids. We're looking at the terpenes on the front page. We see uh, certain marks to show that it's a regulatory, regulatory compliance certificate that is shown in a very specific font and what have you from the state. We're looking at the pesticide panel. We're looking at different levels of pesticides. Now that up top is going to be non-chlorinated and that at the bottom is going to be chlorinated. That is a shipload of pesticides, my friends. Looking at foreign materials, we're looking at microbial. Uh, 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 microbial. We're looking at heavy metal testing. We're looking at mycotoxin. We're looking at moisture content. We're looking at water activity. Holy smokes, that is a lot of info on very little pieces of paper. Our COA used to be much longer. And in the interest of uh, you know, there being an environment and everything for, to look after, we needed to just crush it down to the minimum size as allowable by law. So this is all the information that gets generated for something like a simple report on flowers. I mean, let's be realistic. This costs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. This breaks into over, well over half a dozen different types of tests, different types of analysis run by literal millions of dollars of instruments every time in a line of 150 other samples that are all going through this, that were all received that day just compliance. We're also doing R&D on top of that, although it's worth mentioning that compliance is always what we call full panel and that R&D is virtually never all full panel. You, you can save a little bit of money. If you're just sending something in for potency, you might want to eyeball it and see if there's no spiders on it first and you know you pass the foreign material test as best as you could for the sake of what you're aiming to do. Now, I know I was supposed to leave a little bit of time for Q for Q and A, and I think uh, the last two minutes of the hour. I don't know if it's going to necessarily pass for all of that, but thank you guys so much for sitting through this presentation. I got through it just by the hair of my chin. But please, Candice, let me know if anybody has any questions. If there's anything we I can help answer, uh, thank you guys all for sitting through this. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, Candice, take her away. Yeah, thank you, Nate. You gave us so much information and I feel like I learned a lot. And I know that all of our customers that have never gone through a presentation like this learned a ton of information. So thank you so much. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I would just, um, I would just say to email Nate and he can um, answer any questions that you have and he may have his information here. So thank you for joining us for the Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series. Um, and thanks to Nate for being here today with us. And thanks to Bill Costa Labs for being a great partner in the industry. We hope that we were able to share some information with our viewers today that make you better informed cannabis consumers and that the information will help you find relief. So thank you everybody for being with us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>